Welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Haya Yahya and I will be your moderator for this session. Uh, the main reason we are here today is to raise awareness and celebrate World Engineering Day for Sustainable Development. This occasion is a new occasion. It was proclaimed by UNESCO only in 2019 and held and celebrated officially for the first time last year in 2020. Um, the message of this event, World Engineering Day, is to celebrate engineers and their role particularly in helping communities achieve the United Nations' 17 Sustainable Development Goals for 2030. So our session for today focuses on one of those goals, uh, a goal that is absolutely critical for prosperity and progress, and that is sustainable, devel sustainable development goal number seven, affordable and clean energy. So in recent years, electrification has been a success story. Um, according to the UNDP, between 2000 and 2018, the percent of people around the world who have access to electricity increased from 78 to 90%. And meanwhile, as well, and very promising for our planet, uh, recent estimates show that 17.5% of power was generated through renewable sources. However, even with this progress, there are still various critical issues. Uh, even with increasing access to electricity, one out of 10 people around the world uh, still lacks access to electricity. Uh, most of those people live in remote, isolated areas, some rural areas of the developing world. Many are in sub-Saharan Africa. And meanwhile, as well, around the world, uh, energy demands are increasing, sometimes exponentially in some areas. And most critically, energy remains by far the main contributor to climate change, as it accounts for upward of 70% of human-caused greenhouse gases. So SDG 7, aims to tackle both of these issues by focusing on providing ac wider access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all. It also focuses on increasing, as you can see from the targets here, uh, it also focuses on increasing the share of renewable energy in the global mix. It focuses on improving energy efficiency, investing in clean energy research, and supporting, especially supporting developing countries. Uh, and of course, engineers can play a very significant role in each one of these issues. Joining us today uh, to talk about SDG 7 are professionals with extensive experience in helping communities gain wider access to electricity and in bringing the market's latest renewable technologies to clients and communities around the world. We're joined today by Farah Kazan. Hello, Haya. Hi, Farah. Uh, Farah is an electrical engineer who specializes in high voltage electrical substations and transmission lines. Farah, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. We, al we also have the pleasure to have uh, Mr. Hisham Abdel Adir, who is a senior electrical engineer. Uh, Hisham specializes in renewable energy projects, especially solar PV. Um, Hisham, thank you. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Haya. Thank you. And finally, we have Mr. Leith al uh, Leith is an electrical engineer, project management professional, and lead accredited professional. And he also specializes in photovoltaic and renewable energy systems. Leith, thank you for being here. Thank you. It's my honor. So we're beginning, beginning today's panel with Farah. Uh, Farah, one of the major targets of SDG 7 is to ensure universal access to affordable, reliable, and uh, modern energy services. You have experience, extensive experience, working in countries where electrification rates are low and there's not a lot of access to electricity. Tell us a little bit about, uh, about the challenges of working in such contexts and what your experience has been in general. Well, we have worked in countries which suffer from serious shortages and low electrification rates. Uh, for example, in one major project, the electrification rate in the country was 40% where 35% only were connected to grid and the rest were private. So in order to interconnect uh, the isolated areas and increase the rate of electrified uh, regions, uh, especially with the, with the uh, introduction of a new 2000 megawatt hydropower plant, uh, a new project emerged uh, to uh, introduce uh, new uh, high voltage uh, electrical uh, substations and uh, transmission lines associated with this new power plant. 
So uh, uh, actually this expansion and interconnection will not only uh, maximize the supply of coverage and cater for remote and isolated areas, but will also uh, improve the reliability to already uh, improve reliability of supply to already supplied customers. Uh, so one major project could uh, could have a huge impact because due to the reinforcement of this transmission and distribution network, it was expected that around 2.6 million customers will join the grid by 2022, lifting the electrification rate up to 50%. And the target is even to reach 60% by 2025, and this project was a main contributor. Um, also, in another African country, the need was to provide the more power to continuously growing residential and industrial demands in a part of the country which suffered from serious shortages and power cuts. Um, actually, the project region uh, was supplied from a limited to 20 kV network uh, that cannot sustain any future growth. And the project aims to introduce a new 400 kV overhead transmission line which was one of the longest in the world, around 370 kilometers. Uh, the emergence of this new 400 kV system in the country uh, will uh, not only increase the thermal and stability limits of the power transfer capability of the network, but also improve availability and reliability. Uh, also, it will allow for a flexible future dispatch of power uh, from any future power plant they may be, that may be developed in the region. So these were some uh, examples of major high voltage uh, projects uh, that we were involved in in favor of increasing electrification rate and expansion of the network. OK, so that's what that would look like. Um, and and what what were the challenges here, Farah, uh, on an engineering level? What are the challenges? Well, in, in network expansion projects, our aim is to ensure the electrical feasibility of the project and reduce losses as much as possible. So to meet this challenge, we perform network studies using softwares like PSSE and ETAP to study the steady state and dynamic behavior of the network that is being expanded. Uh, the first major uh, challenge that we usually face in such countries, uh, the countries that we have worked with, is the lack of organized database of the existing uh, elements of the network. Uh, I mean for the generators and transformers and lines. Uh, so in these countries, an extensive field data gathering was required. Uh, but once a complete data collection is achieved, we will have a complete uh, database for the whole country available in our records for any future expansion project. So once we build the model for the network, uh, we then perform steady state simulations like load flow, short circuit contingencies in order to ensure reliability of the network, uh, no major losses in the system, uh, no voltage violations. Uh, also, we perform dynamic simulations to ensure the stability of the network in case of any disturbance like fault or tripping of a line or a shutdown of a generator. Uh, another challenge also in, the, in these countries which suffer from a low electrification rate is because the supply is much more than the demand, uh, the network is weak, being more capacitive. So whenever a new transmission line is to be installed, uh, we observe a high voltage rise violating the over voltage limits. Uh, and this is, of course, I mean in the model, not we try to avoid this in real in real uh, life. So that's why we model the network before uh, installing the, uh, the, the transmission lines. Uh, but on contrary, and because the load is not equally distributed, also we observed some, that some regions uh, suffering from high demand uh, will suffer from under voltage. So in order to, uh, as a medial measure to resolve this issue, uh, we installed reactive compensation equipment to ensure the balance in the network. And as a result of these studies, uh, we uh, properly have to identify uh, the number and sizing of the transformers of these future electrical substations, and as well uh, the number of uh, circuits for the transmission lines, the proper conductor selection, the proper uh, number of conductors per phase, all of these for the future expanded part of the network. Wow, that so these are these are technical excellent technical difficulties, but often as well, I, I know as well there are also budget issues and you have to be incredibly careful for costs and that can sometimes affect uh, your design decisions. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, balancing cost with everything else that you have to handle? 
Yes, sure. We, we are always uh, conscious of the budget limitations of any project, and we strive with the client to ensure that the project cost is uh, within uh, is still optimized while still maximizing quality and standard. But actually, this sometimes will influence our design choices. Uh, for example, I can mention in one project uh, we had to install a 220 kV transmission line uh, um, uh, with a combination of lattice and the tubular towers. Uh, the lattice towers were installed in rural areas where where land is available, but when the line had to uh, to pass uh, through an urban area, we proposed the tubular towers uh, because they require less right of way and less land. Uh, these tubular towers, although they are a bit more expensive than the lattice because they they are uh, heavier and uh, in regards of steel material, but they uh, save much uh, on land and space and compared to, to lattice towers and they are also less expensive than underground cables because as you know underground cables are at least four times more expensive than overhead and require maintenance expertise. Uh, also I can mention on another project the one related to the 400 kV transmission line the 370 kilometers that uh, I already mentioned. Uh, in this project there were a number of uh, measures implemented to ensure and uh, to, to control the cost while maintaining quality. Um, for example, DAR, uh, DAR supported the client in revisiting the conductor selection uh, and uh, presented the advantages and disadvantages of various alternatives until the client approved the low loss conductor, uh, the low loss ECSR, aluminum conductor steel reinforced conductor, a trapezoidal shape. Uh, actually, uh, this conductor uh, resulted in financial long term savings thanks to its reduced heat losses compared to conventional conductors and uh, it saved uh, or it reduced several megawatts for a very long transmission line as in our case. Uh, therefore, availing more power to the network, I mean saving in generation and uh, also uh, benefiting environmentally uh, by reducing pollution in case a generation was needed. Uh, also, another uh, way to bring down the cost, uh, we propose to modify the original concept of the high cost double breaker, double bus bar scheme in substations to a single breaker double bus bar scheme, which are equipped with uh, bypass switches uh, at line base in order to ensure that failure of any line breaker can be substituted by coupler breaker without disruption of the substation service. So actually this uh, this modification uh, not only uh, resulted in savings at the equipment uh, cost, but also in land and space saving uh, by reduced land requirements, uh, which means less environmentally invasive and less uh, resettlements. So uh, in numbers, this resulted in savings of approximately $40 million and uh, the remaining amount helped the client in uh, pursuing additional projects and uh, making uh, future uh, other future expansion projects. That's really incredible. A few changes, but they made that much of a difference. Yes. Um, and uh, so beyond cost, Farah, there are also other limitations that pose some engineering challenges. You, you personally have already mentioned um, that you have to be careful about environmental issues and sometimes there's limitations in lands with dense urban areas. Again, how does that affect your process? What has been your experience with some alternatives that help people, you know, manage environment and uh, land areas, dense land areas? Well, yes, in general, in our transmission line projects, we aim to ensure uh, that the transmission line route is environmentally friendly as much as possible in terms of the right of way and the land it's passing through and towers height. So we define the right of way in terms of uh, presence of obstructions, environmental aspects, social acceptance, and we try, we try to avoid as much as possible crossings with rivers, houses, forests and farms. Uh, and in substations, uh, as I mentioned earlier, also we try to optimize the arrangement of equipment uh, to save land. Uh, and also in many other projects, we proposed and installed the gas insulated substations, GIS, uh, due to land limitations in urban areas or near airports. Uh, why GIS? Because in GIS, the equipment are contained in a sealed environment with SF6 being as an insulating medium, so the equipment are more compact. Uh, in one project with, with particular land limitations, we managed to accommodate 220 kV and 66 kV GISs 
along with five transformers and 24 kV switch gear and just a 50 by 50 meters plot, supplying a load, a maximum peak load of around 160 MVA for a large part of a metropolitan area. Uh, and we designed the building to be multi-story where the GISs were, uh, were at the upper levels connected to the transformers in a vertical way through gas insulated bus bars and the, and the transformers were at the ground floor uh, on independent foundations of course and were screened from the public through louvered panels so so yes uh, we, we we try uh, to uh, to, to respect some environmental concerns uh, in, in installation of substations and transmission lines in our projects that's excellent um, so, so up till now we've been talking, you mentioned all of these are for large infrastructure, these are large infrastructure projects, sometimes for major uh, urban areas, and these have their own challenges. But uh, sometimes, and we've discussed this a little bit before, is uh, you have remote and isolated communities and villages, and it costs a lot of money and a lot of effort to get, if we wanted to get traditional power sources there. Um, so, what are so Farah, in your experience? What are the types of projects that can help us get electricity to people who live very far away and are isolated? What are the options we have here as engineers? Well, uh, we have handled many projects related to bringing electricity to remote to remote areas. Uh, for example, in one project, we had to install a, a, 60, a 60 kV transmission line, but it was environmentally challenging because we had to preserve existing forests and pay attention to logging areas. So uh, to supply and reach a relatively far and, uh, and uh, off-grid uh, village in one of the countries, uh, we had to propose a hybrid solar power plant to supply the village. So sometimes uh, uh, proposing environmental friendly power sources where applicable like solar or wind is a must in our projects. Uh, also in another project, we propose the three mini hydro uh, turbines, uh, cross flow turbines, uh, each around 500 kilowatt only, but the total which was around 1.5 megawatt was uh, adequate enough to supply villages, uh, some houses in the villages and street lighting and relieved the village from having to get diesel from uh, local diesel power plants, where sometimes it took a very long time due to uh, bumpy roads. So also uh, hydro uh, turbines or hydro power plants are sometimes a very good solution for far and hard to reach areas. Uh, and in this particular project, the turbines were special and fit to purpose and uh, their efficiency did not reduce or drop with the, with the reduced flows as with other uh, conventional turbines. Uh, usually these turbines come in, uh, can, uh, in around 5 megawatt sizes maximum and they are suitable for hydro uh, power plants and variable flow conditions. Uh, so, so these were some examples of, of renewable generation that were of benefit uh, for remote isolated areas. Yes, I'm, ju I'm sure those, those communities also found it very empowering as well. Um, so Farah, as a final uh, as a final question to you, thank you so much. Um, there are some very new, promising uh, new trends in electrification, especially in smart technologies and renewable energy. I know you and your team are keeping a very close eye on these new new trends and so on. Tell us about your outlook. How how does it look? What are the new trends? How does it look? And what's coming next? Uh, new trend now is a smart grid which uh, unlike conventional grid, it's characterized by enhanced uh, communication uh, technology systems and by uh, bi-directional power flow between the customer and the utility, as well as uh, adaptive monitoring control and protection systems that allow real-time information across the network, uh, including the distribution network with where, where decentralized generation is connected. Uh, so smart grids are becoming more popular uh, for distribution network, not only transmission networks, where uh, small on-grid renewable sources are being connected at the medium voltage level. Uh, so that's why maybe uh, MV networks are becoming more of a, uh, a backbone uh, requiring full reliability and remote sensing. Uh, but but uh, the challenge now in smart uh, grids is the still developing legislations and policies between uh, for energy exchange between different stakeholders, which are utilities, consumers, uh, governments, manufacturers, system operators. Um, 
Another challenge in smart grid is uh, to accompany the increasing uh, technology required by smart cities, but keeping in mind that environmental protection does not always implicate reduction in electric energy, but rather total energy. Uh, for example, uh, electric cars uh, require power, but save on pollution. Uh, generation of hydrogen uh, requires an extensive amount of electricity. Uh, also, the conversion of various thermal processes and in industry to uh, electrical uh, increases the electrical demand rather than reduce it. So I believe that the ideal solution is to promote renewable sources to the maximum extent possible. For example, uh, green hydrogen is now being promoted thanks to solar power plants uh, as opposed to blue hydrogen, which was or conventionally made from uh, conventional sources. Uh, but I think also that it's worth recalling that this rapid or complete transition to renewable may sometimes be faced by political opposition and countries which are quite reliant on conventional technologies because there are many countries uh, which, which have a lot of coal mines and very strong coal miner unions and where uh, their trucking industries are very reliant on coal. Re replacing this will result in uh, economical and political opposition that has to be assessed as well. Uh, also, another point that I would like to mention in order to reduce electrical and thermal energy uh, on the load side, whether residential or industrial level, uh, demand side management is required, should be considered, load shedding should be applied, uh, efficient motors should be used, uh, also selection of products and processes uh, that result in minimized uh, thermal or electrical demand. Uh, I think also that the advent of industries should be coordinated with the Ministry of Energy and Ministry of Industry uh, in order to ensure that these industries are, are well coordinated with the uh, energies master plan of the country. Uh, and if not, then discussions maybe with the industrial stakeholders should be uh, promoted to uh, to initiate own captive uh, generation industry, uh, therefore not only being almost independent on main electric supply, but also exporting power uh, to the uh, utilities. So utilities should be open also to this possibility. So I believe that uh, smart grids uh, should double the global rate of improving energy efficiency, which is one of the major SDG 7 goals as well. Thank you so much, Farah. That was uh, incredibly insightful. Um, so we already have some questions uh, from the audience. Uh, thank you for that. Keep sharing them. If you have any questions for Farah, please share them uh, on the side. They will come to me anonymously and I will hopefully post them to, to Farah at the end of the session. Thank you again, Farah. Okay, um, so our next speaker, Mr. Hisham Abdel Adir, is one of the engineers at DAR who are most involved in uh, the transition to renewable energy. Hisham, we spoke earlier about how there are many exceptional researchers and technology developers around the world who are bringing powerful new renewable energy technologies to the market. We also discussed how engineers who work at DAR and at other companies that are similar uh, our role is to take these latest technologies and make sure that they are introduced to clients and communities and implemented on the ground through the projects that we work that we work with. Uh, tell us a little bit about that, starting with what's the role of energy specialists such as yourself in project planning? Yes, Haya, thank you. As you know that traditionally engineers have focused on meeting the project's power demands in the most efficient ways even if the resources that they are using are not suitable, or are not sustainable and not healthy for the environment. But nowadays there is a global energy transition and we as engineers are more focused on providing clean energy that is sustainable, reliable and environmentally friendly. And to do that effectively, we start at the project's early planning phase by studying the available energy sources at project site and also evaluating the feasibility of using each source. These could include, for example, the utility grid, local generators, solar and wind plants, and so on. In the following stages, we develop the project's design based on optimal combination of the available sources 
to maximize the use of renewable energy while achieving a minimum cost per kilowatt hour. Fantastic. And of course, this transition is very, very uh, well needed. Um, how, do, how are you seeing the market reaction uh, to renewable energy? So we, we are trying to incorporate it, but how are you seeing the market reaction and the MENA region to renewables? Is there an acceptance of renewables? Have you seen in your experience? Yes, actually, there is a rising awareness in MENA region about new energy technologies uh, together with a huge potential for solar and wind specifically. Also, many countries' regulations now allow for renewables to be connected to the public grid, either through PPAs, net metering, or self-consumption schemes. Uh, based on these factors together, we see our clients demanding higher standards, higher standards for clean and efficient energy in the new projects. Uh, excellent. So, so they are actually demanding those. That's fun. and and um, I know I know that you you personally have been involved in many many projects that are that incorporated renewable energy. Um, you you what has what has been like? Can you give us some examples of how, what that looks like and what do you do exactly during the different design stages? Yeah, sure. Uh, besides the major electrification projects and utility scale PV plants that my colleagues are presenting today. Also, the majority of projects that we delivered in the past five to seven years rely partially on renewable energy. For example, uh, first in large scale developments such as city scale master plans, industrial areas, uh, large airports, we work closely with project stakeholders to embed solar PV and wind plants within the project energy strategy. And also we coordinate these plants within the power scheme and the overall master plan. And second example is for projects in remote areas or where the utility grid is unreliable. For example, in some locations in Africa and some remote areas or islands in the Gulf countries, we use hybrid microgrids as the prime power supply instead of the traditional solutions such as diesel generators alone. And the hybrid microgrid is practically a mini grid combining different sources for example, diesel generators, utility supply, PV and wind, uh, in addition to energy storage system and an advanced control system. We carry out a careful analysis of the project load profile to assess the energy demand, and we optimize the design to achieve maximum share of renewables, highest reliability, and lowest initial and running costs. And third example could be in the buildings projects uh, where we utilized we, we utilize PV systems to save a percentage of the building of the building energy consumption. And this may include, for example, rooftop PV, bifacial PV integrated in canopies and similar structures, or building integrated PV. We coordinate the design with all other disciplines to maximize the benefits of PV system and to achieve the highest added value for the project. And the last example in, is in water pumping applications where we use solar water pumping to deliver a sustainable water supply. Sometimes it's complemented with water or energy storage. This is depending on the project requirements and the benefits of such system are even greater for communities in remote areas. Yes, uh, Fareha also discussed that as well, uh, how, how this kind of technology brings, brings this resilience to uh, to remote communities. Um, Hisham, on, on another note, what about improvements in energy efficiency and uh, other technologies that are more on the demand side? Uh, what's, what's your perspective on that? Yes, uh, actually mentioning the demand side or behind the meter, we have also witnessed the new trends which can be summarized as follows. Uh, first, in energy, the energy efficiency measures are becoming normally applied in buildings projects for example, LED lighting, smart controls, efficient, efficient appliances, uh, submetering, and so on. These are considered low-hanging fruits uh, that can be implemented with minor costs, but they have a significant role in energy savings, even for projects which are not targeting certification under any of the green rating systems. And second, for the outdoor LED lighting is adapted in most of the new infrastructure projects. Also, solar street lighting started to become widely used in some projects, especially with the falling prices of battery storage systems. 
And finally, modern, te modern technologies such as electric vehicles and smart buildings are starting to evolve in MENA region, and the infrastructure provisions for these systems are being included in the, in the design of majority of our new projects. Fantastic. It's actually very inspiring to see that renewable technologies are actually being demanded and being uh, considered now a very strong part of these projects. Um, moving forward, uh, what, what are the, the, the insights that you, as we move forward with this, with this foundation, uh, what are the general insights that you see about renewables in the MENA region in the next couple of years? Yes, in fact, as you know, the world is undergoing an energy transition towards renewables and the MENA region is no exception. We have seen ambitious plans in many countries to increase the share of renewables in their energy mix, and this strategy is foreseen to continue on a larger scale. Nowadays, it's safe to say that many renewable energy technologies have reached technical and economic maturity. For example, the levelized cost of electricity produced by PV and wind plants, this has fallen to very competitive prices. During the past few years, we have witnessed PV tenders falling, falling to around $25 to $30 per megawatt hour. And today, the recent tenders in MENA region are significantly below $20 per megawatt hour, which is even comparable to electricity produced by some fossil fuels. Also, new PV technologies such as bifacial modules and high power modules 500 plus and 600 plus watt peak these are becoming mainstream in the market. These modules, which are based on 210 millimeters or 182 millimeter cells, these can reduce the plant's balance of system costs, hence reducing the cost per megawatt hour. And also the same applies to wind energy, where large wind turbines with nominal power 4 to 6 megawatt onshore and 12 to 14 megawatt offshore, these are dominating the utility scale projects and all of these factors together uh, drive further reduction in the cost of energy produced by PV and wind plants. And finally, I think floating PV is foreseen to be widely used in hydro hydroelectric facilities in the Middle East and Africa. Uh, especially these systems can be adapted to boost the power generation and also to save water by decreasing the ev evaporation rates of from water bodies. We, ha we are witnessing pilot projects in progress to test this technology under local conditions in the MENA region, while large-scale projects are not implemented yet. Okay, well, that's, that's certainly an interesting thing that we'd like to see, floating PV. Um, are, are there any other emerging, te uh, emerging technologies that are going to affect, uh, th that you see are going to affect the renewable energy markets? Any emerging technologies? Yes, in fact, uh, one of the major limitations on adopting renewable energy on a wide scale is the ability of existing power networks to absorb intermittent energy, such as the energy produced by PV and wind plants. And here comes the critical role of utility scale battery storage to stabilize the power networks by supplying or absorbing power when needed to mitigate the effects of, intermi of intermittency. And this also allows for a deeper penetration of PV and wind energy in the total energy mix. And as you know that the capital cost of battery storage systems have fallen by more than 85% in the past decade. And also recent studies anticipate further reduction in battery costs. This is based on mass production of lithium ion batteries. And finally, uh, one of the major technologies that we are that are very promising and we are keeping a very a, a very close eye on is the green hydrogen as the far as far highlighted which is the hydrogen produced by using clean and renewable energy sources actually green hydrogen has come under spotlights lately because of its unique benefits to major sectors in the energy industry especially sectors that were previously difficult to decarbonize I can mention, for example, the transportation sector and heavy industry sector. And also the advantages of green hydrogen include mainly the local availability of the resource in seawater and also availability of huge untapped resources of PV and wind in MENA region, which can be utilized to power the hydrogen production facilities. Also, the, also the hydrogen can be produced and stored for future use 
hence reducing the need for battery storage. And finally, hydrogen can be used in transportation via fuel cells, or it can be used in power generation as a clean fuel source. Uh, finally, I would like to highlight that with falling prices of the hydrogen electrolyzers, again, the key word here is mass production. We foresee a, a large potential for hydrogen in MENA region, specifically green hydrogen, especially that several countries have already started pilot projects in this regard. Yeah, actually, funnily enough, uh, recently there was an announcement from NEOM and uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia that they are going to build a very large green hydrogen uh, plant. And that, that's exactly, uh, that's in line with what you're saying. Uh, Hisham, yes, exactly. uh, thank you. Any last words about the role of energy engineers? And I know it's a very big role uh, in meeting SDG 7. Yes, the role of energy specialists involves deep understanding of each novel energy technology its advantages, uh, potential, limitations, and so on. Besides a clear vision on how to adapt the optimum energy source for every project, doing this, we consider the technical and economic feasibility of each design option, and also analyze the life cycle cost of the energy system to offer our clients the optimum return on investments while achieving the targets of SDG 7. Yes. Yes, and, and of course, uh, that, that, is play, that does play a very important role. Uh, green energy is fantastic, but we also have to prove that it's worth the investment and it, fast it is fast becoming that as well. Uh, Hisham, true. thank you so much. Uh, there were some questions for you in the Q&A. Um, I've shared them with you already, and hopefully when, when, uh, when the Q&A begins, um, we will, I will post them to you. Um, yes. for, for our audience, of course, if you have more questions for Hisham, Please, uh, please let him know. But for now, we're going to transition to our final speaker. Thank you, Hisham. Thank you. Okay. Our final speaker. Mr. Leith Laham, Leith, thank you for being with us again. Um, so Leith has been extensively involved in promoting and incorporating renewable energy. A moment ago, um, Hisham said that uh, the transition towards renewable energy is fast becoming uh, an, a part of the national policy. Uh, Leith, you're actually based in Jordan, a country that has such a policy and has a very ambitious agenda for uh, electrification and renewable energy. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, hi, Haya. Thank you for your brief introduction and thanks for giving me the opportunity to participate as a speaker within this panel. Uh, in line with the United Nations SDG 7.1 and 7.2, uh, Jordan has undertaken significant steps towards achieving these goals. My home country is among the highest in the world in dependency on foreign energy resources with around 96% of the country energy needs coming from imported oil and gas. This complete reliance on foreign oil and gas consumes a significant amount of Jordan's GDP. Even though Jordan has a semi-arid uh, desert terrain and is considered one of the poorest countries in water resources, Jordan luckily has a 10-month period of consistent sunshine and moderate temperatures. Jordan's endeavor to secure sustainable supply of energy and optimal utilization of natural resources came to action via developing appropriate policies, legalization, and programs to diverse energy resources with the aim to scale up renewable energy contribution and improve energy efficiency in various sectors. Uh, I can summarize Jordan's strategic plan objectives uh, with these uh, upcoming points. Uh, first, achieving a secure energy supply through uh, divergence of energy resources. This aim is mainly being uh, achieved through solar photovoltaic plants, in addition to wind and geothermal technologies. Develop the utilization of conventional energy resources like oil shell. Uh, enhance energy efficiency in various sectors. Uh, multiple proje uh, projects has been done here in Jordan to replace uh, oil chillers, for example, with a new RF, VRF system that is more efficient, and others to replace an old halogen and uh, conventional fluorescent lighting with LED uh, more efficient lighting. Uh, 
the most important step in my opinion the government take is to enhance uh, is to improve the investment environment and encourage private sector participation by offering a zero tax on all the inputs of uh, renewable energy projects. Uh, upgrading the infrastructure to be able to transmit and distribute uh, the power that will be generated from renewable energy. Uh, for example, in 2017, the National Electric Power Company, NEPCO, uh, tendered the, the so-called Green Corridor with the aim to strengthen the high voltage backbone of the Jordanian grid. Uh, with, the, with the completion date scheduled to be in 2025, the project will ex expand the grid capacity of Jordan from 3.7 to 3.6 to 4.6 gigawatt, uh, and will raise the capacity of the connection from the south of the kingdom, where most of the renewable energy projects are located, to the north of the kingdom, where the center of load and the capital, Amman and Zarqa and Erbet cities are located by installing a new high voltage substation and uh, two, income, uh, two uh, 400 kilovolt overhead lines. Uh, I want to see with you the, in the next figure the growth of renewables in Jordan. Uh, as you can see, the percentage of renewables increased from 1% on 2015 to almost 10% through uh, four years, and now it's uh, for sure higher. And that's that's a very ambitious plan for Jordan, and um, very inspiring to see that this is happening. Uh, so, so what's our role? What's the role of engineering teams like DARS and others uh, in making this possible? Uh, DAR utilizes its extensive knowledge of PV system to provide clients with reliable, sustainable, and operating PV systems. Energy yield simulations, shade analysis, glare analysis, and the grid impact studies are performed to ensure that the design is optimal and the most cost-effective solution. Uh, we do feasibility studies and provide clients with financial indicators that display project feasibility through payback period, return on investment, and uh, rate of return figures, so clients can see how much attractive their investment will be. Yes, and again, that's that's also very, very important. And uh, I know you have a project to share with us. Uh, um, there, there's these these projects. Um, each one of them has has its own impact. Um, how how what's the kind of impact that they're expected to have? These renewable energy projects that that you have been involved in. This is one exciting challenge I am always uh, recall. Uh, there was a project for an organization with the aim to offset uh, its own branches and uh, hotels electricity consumption via remote renewable PV plants that's connected to grid through wheeling scheme. The project has been completed and uh, now operational and its sustainable out uh, outcome was quite impressive for me. Uh, these plants will offset greenhouse gas emission from th 13,500 passenger vehicles driven for one year, imagine. Alternatively, or in other terms, will offset 7,200 typical household energy use for one year. It also, in these hard times, provided jobs to the local community as part of the corporate social uh, responsibility. Uh, finally, I want to mention that uh, this was, in short, the situation here in Jordan, how it uh, looks like. Uh, although of the financial challenges and lack of resources, I think Jordan faced circumstances wisely and in a way that will be beneficial to the people and uh, the environment. Thank you very much, Leith. That's that that is really, really inspiring to listen to. Um, OK, so that, that was our uh, three speakers. Uh, I'm going to start the Q&A now. Uh, there's um, there's a bunch of questions already, and uh, so we'll, we'll we'll actually start Farah with you. You're our you're our first speaker. Um, so Farah, uh, the first question I had for you was uh, you mentioned GIS substations as a good option for urban areas uh, that do not have a lot of space to build big. Um, however, the question that was posed here is that those substations usually have some impact on the environment, maybe not the directly, uh, not the directly surrounding environment, but but on the environment in general. Uh, what is the what is the trend with that uh, in your experience? Uh, 
Um, well, yes, sure. Uh, SF6 is widely known as a, a greenhouse gas or a global warming gas. Uh, and it's pure, it's not toxic, uh, but uh, it may cause a uh, breathing hazard. Uh, so it's not, uh, it doesn't support life. Uh, and actually, uh, one kilogram of SF6 when, when, when leaked uh, into the atmosphere is equivalent to around 22,800 kilograms of, so of CO2, uh, causing further ozone depletion. And also SF6 is, is it's heavier than air. It's usually con collected uh, uh, near the uh, ground, uh, near cable trenches in the substations and drainage system. Uh, but but governments are taking are taking actions uh, in order to reduce uh, uh, the emission and consumption of this SF6 gas. And uh, in energy industries, uh, companies uh, uh, are operating and maintaining SF6 switch gear uh, in a responsible manner. Uh, this includes managing of uh, the switch gear in a closed cycle to avoid the release of the gas into atmosphere, and also monitoring uh, the emissions during operation. And uh, and also uh, world uh, world class manufacturers like ABB, GE, uh, Siemens, and Hitachi are uh, are seeking for uh, alternatives for of of, of uh, SF6, and these are still under research. They are seeking for environmental friendly gases like G3 gases. So so I believe that that the trend is towards replacing SF6 gas because yes, it is dangerous when when it depletes uh, or uh, when. Uh, when it is uh, leaked into the atmosphere. Yeah, excellent. But of course, we pay, uh, pay close attention to that and uh, to, to further trends and making it healthier. Uh, Farah, yeah. I also have one other question for you, um, which was you mentioned uh, react, react, uh, sorry, uh, capacitive uh, networks, and you mentioned that there were some, uh, not, I, I believe what this is referring to is when the network has more supply than demand, and you mentioned that there were some measures that were taken. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what are the measures that you take with, with this type of network? Because I, I understand that's a bit sensitive. Okay. Uh, what I meant by the reactive compensation equipment here are the reactors and capacitors. Uh, we have to properly locate where we have to install reactors or capacitors because as I mentioned earlier, uh, the transmission, the very long transmission lines uh, cause uh, voltage uh, rises in the network that violates the over voltage limits. So for this purpose, uh, reactors will, uh, should be installed at uh, line base, at line base in substations in order to consume this generated power and uh, also we may propose uh, locations at the substation bus bar when loads fluctuate when load fluctuates so we perform uh, contingency simulations to properly locate uh, the uh, proper location of these reactors and their sizing and uh, for cases where i said that we have some voltage drops in the network uh, we propose uh, capacitors because capacitors uh, increase the voltage in the network. Unlike reactors, reactors act as loads; they they reduce the voltage. So, uh, so therefore, we try to uh, install capacitors in the substations at high voltage level. Here, I'm uh, I'm speaking, uh, in order to increase this voltage rise, and in order to increase the voltage again. Excellent. Uh, excellent. Thank you so much, Farah. Uh, I also have a few questions for uh, Hisham. Yep. Uh, Hisham, uh, uh, we have we have a question from Sangram. He says, uh, "How how the, how's the grid resilience maintained?" Uh, as so, you, so you mentioned uh, integrating uh, renewable energy. So he's asking, "How is the resilience of the grid maintained with the inter integration of more and more uh, renewable energy? Uh, how is the grid energy to be taken care of?" Yeah, actually, this is a very important question. And the answer to this is that uh, in, in every country that has the renewable energy plans, uh, before announcing these plans, the utility company in this uh, country, they do some extensive studies about the ability of the existing power network to absorb the renewable energy and the amounts of energy that can be connected to this grid and the allowed locations where these plants can be located. Uh, so this is to limit the disturbances or the effect of intermittency on the existing power networks. And also uh, another solution uh, or a complementary solution is the usage of uh, utility scale energy storage, 
which can help to stabilize the grid network against uh, the intermittency caused by uh, intermittent uh, renewable sources. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Hisham, there was, there was another question, which is that, as, which is about energy storage. Um, he says, uh, uh, is the energy storage mandatory for solar power plants in uh, the MENA region? I understand maybe he's talking about batter, battery storage, is that correct? Yes, uh, actually, th this is also a very good question, um, but to answer that, uh, it seems uh, the question, it seems a bit general. Um, so, it, yeah, I mean, you, you, you could mean the plants, con larger plants connected to the grid network or even small systems connected to the grid, grid network, on grid systems, I mean, yeah. or you mean off grid systems. So, uh, my answer is that uh, PV systems generally, they generate intermittent power, uh, which is not dispatchable. I mean, if you have uh, an off-grid load, like uh, a remote house or farm, for example, and you have a standalone PV system not connected to a diesel generator, not connected in parallel with the utility network, it's a totally off-grid system, you cannot use uh, PV alone to feed that load uh, without using batteries. Uh, you will need to connect PV in parallel with a dispatchable source, I mean uh, PV in parallel with a diesel generator or PV complemented with a battery storage system, so that you can have a stable power supply to feed your loads. Uh, if you mean grid connected systems, uh, like uh, small uh, rooftop systems in buildings, for example, or even large utility scale PV plants, in this case, uh, no, uh, energy storage is not mandatory at all. You can connect the system to the network without energy storage. You just follow the regulations and the requirements of the utility company. Uh, and what I mean with utility scale energy storage is, uh, is a storage system um, implemented at, uh, at the national level, at the utility scale level, to stabilize the overall grid network. Excellent. Excellent. Um, yeah. Uh, Hisham, there was also uh, one other question. I'm not. I'm not sure if this is uh, part part of your scope. Uh, they asked, uh, how how is a grid impact study carried out? Um, I'm not. Is, uh, I'm not sure if this is part of your of your scope. Have you have you done grid impact studies? I think Farah could answer this question. Better. I can answer this question. Oh, left. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Okay. Uh, grid impact studies are uh, calculated on uh, softwares like ETAP or SKM. Uh, based on the accepted uh, grid code in uh, the country, uh, it calculates the voltage dip, the voltage rise in case of the plant uh, go out of the grid, and the uh, frequency rise and the frequency drop. Based on that and these results and uh, the grid code limitations, the plant uh, may be accepted or may be needed to be split to uh, two parts, three parts, and the energy to be injected on multiple uh, point of common connections. Point of common couplings. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you very much for that, Liv. Um, I'll, I think I'll take uh, one, one, one more question, uh, which is, but, but again, I'm, I'm not sure if this is uh, something that is. Uh, uh, so it's uh, is Dick, Sil Dick Silent a better software for dynamic studies than ETAP? Now, I, I know you guys don't really like to compare softwares. Um, Everything has its own use. So, so what, what do you? Use? So, I'll just ask, what do you use uh, for for dynamic studies of this kind? I'd rather not 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 compare programs. Uh, hi, usually uh, we use uh, ETAP is more mostly known for uh, distribution networks uh, because it uh, it can do a load flow and transient studies, but uh, also it can do uh, harmonic studies and uh, motor acceleration studies. Uh, but PSSE and Big Silent are known more for uh, high voltage uh, transmission projects and the substations. So, uh, so usually what we use for uh, especially transient studies, we use the PSSE and uh, so yes, we are using PSSE, but Dick Silent is also uh, like PSSE. Okay, um, thank you so much, Farah. Uh, well, well, actually, um, so 
we'll actually wrap up uh, our session today. Um, thank you so much, Hisham, uh, for joining us. Hisham, Farah, um, Leith, uh, thank, thank you. you so much for being here today. Um, and taking taking some of your time to share it um, for sh for sure this is this is very important um, you know raising awareness for for these kinds of issues uh, engineers are working every day to increase the access to electricity and to try to make uh, renewable energy and as you've heard today there are many many challenges um, if you want to know more about Dar's work uh, please go to www.dar.com it's very easy. Um, you can you can f find out a little bit more about what we do. You can also connect with our professionals on LinkedIn. Some of them are on LinkedIn, or reach out to uh, to, to us um, for, and we will we will put you in touch with with these uh, with these experts. Um, we will hopefully try to make a recording of this available to everyone who was here. Thank you so much for joining us um, again for everyone who was here and everyone who has participated in the Q and A. Thank you, and we hope to see you um, hopefully in future events. Thank you very, very much.